Blood Covenant, a V5 Sabbat story, is a production of Simulacra Studios. This podcast is intended for mature audiences and contains descriptions of violent sexual activity, mental illness, body horror, and inhuman supernatural depravity. If you are not comfortable with what you hear, please feel free to skip ahead or stop listening. If you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash Simulacra Studios. Now, all I have to say is a pack is not what it's cracked up to be. But we have to leave tomorrow night, so we get to have a little bit of fun tonight, but we can't spend too much time here. I'm going to be leaving in a few hours, just so you know. I'm You all are big boys and girls. You can get home when you need to, but I'll be leaving shortly, so don't make too much of an ass of yourselves. I, was about, I thought you were about to tell me not to make too much racket when I come in. That too, but I'm, I would think Buck would do that more than you. So as you guys are getting yourselves comported to head back out into the room, you guys notice that the sound of the music has gone down significantly outside. Oh, they must be kicking off the show out there. Show? Oh, yeah, they did mention there was some shit happening. Oh, let's go see what this is all about. I think it might be a blood feast. I mean, that's the way they kind of described it, yeah. Mm, Phycos is here. They may be doing something in her honor. Of course, she already had the uh, the bloodbath going on, which she's she's really something. She hot. I would love for you to meet Frisky Ficos. I think you would get along wonderfully with her. Right on. If she's an elder of my clan, I doubt she'd be attractive in a way you would find traditional. You don't know what I like. I I, I went to Red Lobster one time and thought a crawfish was hot. You don't know me. Oh, well, then you might really like her then. Did you tell people that when you had that thought come into your head? Or was that like an intrusive thought where you're like, you know, I'd fuck that crawfish. Layla, you know me. I I tell people every thought that comes into my head. They... Was the crawfish spicy? Like, did it have a lot of spices on it? Because then, yes, it would be hot. No. Hmm. You'd fuck that crawdad, huh? Basically, you're a goddamn perfect teddy bear and I love you. I am walking into the main room. I'm ignoring this conversation that's happening behind me. Leon, no. Please come back. So, Leon, as you walk out, and as the rest of you do, much like the first time you came back into this room, there are much fewer people in it. There are some mortals, but they are not having a good time anymore. Everyone has been sort of corralled into little roped-off areas, and there's a couple of canine minding these small groups of people. There's maybe about 20 people humans left here but as you guys filter in coming out of the same hall that you guys came out of to get out of the conference room there is a procession of mostly men there are a few women mostly older people all in prison jumpsuits are being marched by a pair of very stocky looking men with shotguns, just sort of prodding them down the line. And they are looking very confused. Despite being told to shut up repeatedly, a couple of them are shouting, saying, this isn't where we're supposed to go. I, I you know, I made these arrangements. You know, wh- why, why are we still in the city? And eventually one of these gentlemen passes you as you guys are sort of waiting off to the side. And he turns directly into Leon's face. He says, who the fuck are you? Why are you? Is this your thing? What's going on here? When he locks eyes on him, and like is like actively challenging Leon, his massive hand is over this dude's throat and he's picking him up. Like, full like potence, everything, just like this dude can't talk anymore. I'm going to look up at the uh, strangled figure and just, language and leave. <laughs> Your money's no good here. I'm going to eat him in front of everyone, and I'm going to use Brutal Feed, which basically, that mortal is a husk within seconds. So I'm going to turn this towards Leon, and right after he's finished, and go, I I wouldn't have minded having his money, fuck. And he'll just drop the husk of, of a person, and I'm assuming that shuts everyone else up. Oh yeah, all the people in the line, all the mortals sort of in the pens, like a hush goes over, the lighting 
changes suddenly to more black light comes up and you see that like in invisible paint like phrases like eat the rich and die piggy die but shit that would have been scrawled on like the manson family murder house just everywhere and as soon as his body hits the ground drained of blood and totally lifeless pandemonium breaks out the music becomes fast and angry the sound of screams can be barely heard over the screeching guitars and pounding drums as people start getting torn out of cages, drained and ripped apart as the blood feast begins. One of the women in the procession like just sort of falls to her knees, and almost on instinct she comes up to you, Buck, and starts like grabbing at your ankle and like crying. She doesn't know why she's going to you for safety and comfort, but she is. I'm going to run over and kick her off of Buck. I just uh, sort of snap my foot out and block Paisley's kick. And that just seems to endear you to her even more. She's just, like, trying to crawl up. And I'm going to put a hand out, like a, like a hold on to, to Paisley. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my, my hand, I'm going to reach under this young lady's chin, and I'm going to pull her up, and I'm going to wipe her tears away. And I'm going to say, darling, why are you scared? I don't know what's going on. I wasn't, I was supposed to be, I was supposed to be going to jail. I didn't. What's happening? You, you, you're getting something so much better. You're getting, you're getting set free from a prison, from a prison that you don't even see the bars of. You see this, this life, this belongings, these things that own you, they have been your prison. And darling, I'm here to tell you, you don't know freedom like I do. I got nothing. I got nobody. I don't even love myself. I have nothing holding me back. There are no bars for myself. Don't you understand? She is just like crying, captivated by your words and your eyes, and like, but like seeing all this horrible shit in the periphery, and like, you just see the little, the little glass that is her brain just start to shatter and break as she just doesn't understand the incongruity of what you're saying with what she's seeing. Sweetheart, life, life is the longest, most horrible prison we are ever forced to suffer. These people here, they're, they're just setting you free. That was beautiful, Buck. Not knowing what to do, she just wraps her arms around you and tries to hold on to you as tight as she can. So to, so to go? I also want to hug Buck. I accept the group hug, and as the group hug comes in, I kill her. Okay, yeah, you latch on, and so do you take the blood, or do you go further? No, I'm not. I told her I was going to set her free, and so I do, I, uh, and I make sure that she dies in the wrap of ecstasy from my kiss and not in pain. When her body is, of course, I gain no sustenance from it, but I do it anyway, and I let them share in it if they'd like. Okay. So, yeah, Layla, you get in on this hug with this poor woman? Yeah, I'm just like, oh, God, that was so beautiful, Buck. You're absolutely right. We're stuck in this fucking horrible flesh prison, and I want you to know that, God, that was just, that was good. And then when she's dead, I I carry her um, as sort of like a cradle carry wrapped around my body out to the car because I am going to need to eat later. Okay, so that's that's a little sweet. What about Reggie? How does Reggie respond to what's going on with Buck and what's going on around? I don't think that would be his style. I mean, he's probably not having, like, a hard time with what's happening. He doesn't mind the eating. Like, eating's eating. We have to do that. But when he kind of still gets a little squeamish when he sees people, like, doing funsy backbreakers on people, like, wee! Look at his spine pop out! Like, that's not up Reggie's alley, per se. But he also knows that that's, uh, this is not a place to question these things. And if he wants to leave this building, he'll, he'll have to just let that go. So, he's gonna, if there's no more people making too much fucking noise and yelling at him or in his general vicinity, he's going for the door. Okay, so you got, so Layla and Buck and Reggie head out eventually. What about Paisley? Oh, I'm heading out. I'm just very happy that, see, when she latched onto his like, that's like a bad puppy hump in your leg and you just gotta kick him off. So, uh, but he handled that very well and I'm, I'm happy for him. So I'm going to follow him out with um, his gift-wrapped takeout. 
Leon, are you following them out as well? Or are you? He'll do a very quick round, like, does anyone need to talk to me type of thing. No one is in a talking mood right now. And then he's just gonna he's just gonna have his cigar and walk on out now that he's all full. Okay, yeah. So you guys exit the building. You uh, have your to go bag, Buck, as well, and you guys know that you have a few hours left before dawn. What is everyone doing in these few hours left in New York? I'm packing and very much praying. Okay, so you're basically heading back to the Haven and getting all of your religious artifacts and, and pages of uh, scripture. And and of course, the communion shot glass. Oh yeah, gotta have the communion shot glass. Tumbler. Tumbler of Cain. So Reggie, you're looking for your grad student buddy? Yeah, I'm gonna go try to meet up with my, my one resource that I have that gets me most my anesthetics and equipment, because I have no idea how easy I'm gonna come by this stuff in Montreal without making friends. You go to the place you normally do. You know, your your interactions with this guy are fairly minimal. It's very business-like. When you get there, your package is waiting for you, but he is not at his workstation where he normally is. I will give him a... a, Yeah, is there a sticky note? Yeah, there's a pack of sticky notes. And I'll just write, got it, and I'll put it on his thing, and I'll take the package, but this is weird, and he broke the rules a little here, or at least my rules, so... I'm going to go to the bathroom and make sure everything's where it needs to be. Uh, yeah, everything in the package is fine. All right. What about Layla? How does Layla spend her last night in New York? It's a shame because she really likes New York. New York has that same Las Vegas vibe to her. It's because it's always awake. It's humming. And I think she's sad that she won't be able to stay and experience it more. But she gets her girls ready. She probably has them in a motel or something, uh, taking them wherever she goes. And I guess she's going to get them ready to travel, maybe put them on a bus or... Yeah, you can make travel arrangements. They can, if you're planning on sending them up, then yeah, you can make travel arrangements for them pretty easy. Yeah, that's my thought. I uh, don't feel super good about just leaving them in New York. I'll bring them with me. It's probably a bad idea, but I mean, we have to have some bad ideas. Absolutely. And what about Leon? How does Leon spend his last few hours in the Big Apple? He's actually going to go... He probably knows a couple places that are like dyed-in-the-wool active Catholic, like you can do confession at any time. 24-7 24-7 type of places and he'll probably go and spend some time in the church. He probably won't go to confession because he just did that recently and you know, I just killed a dude. That's fine. But then he'll he'll just make some, some very quick arrangements of like, hey, I'm going out of town for a little while. If you need me, you can reach me here. Like, I probably have a pager because it's 98. You can reach me at my pager like normal. I'll be back. I don't know when I'll be back. That kind of stuff. And then he'll probably come back to the Haven about an hour before dawn and set everything up that he needs to set up and get packed. Check in with everyone, make sure everyone's there and everyone's good. Yeah, you make your arrangements. You don't talk to the Padre directly because there's, you know, you talk to basically one of the subordinate priests who let you know that he had a late meeting with some other uh, other church officials. But yeah, you're able to square all that away and head back to the Haven, which leaves us with Buck. So you have your to-go bag, as it were. Are you uh, taking care of yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm going to render the package, if you will, uh, in a clinical and experienced way. Um, not messy. I mean, Buck is from Alabama. He's a hunter. So he renders down what he needs out of it. Uh, and then, you know, I think the appropriate thing would be, uh, you know, I know that this person was in life a very rich person who clearly had gotten rich due to some ill-gotten gains. And I think that the most respectful way to dispose of the rest of her body would be to throw it in a landfill. So I'm gonna do that. He'll go ahead and top himself off, um, have a meal. He doesn't subject the rest of the pack to that. He knows it's it's uh, a little more than Reggie can probably handle. And he'll probably just sort of wander You know, New York is pretty interesting. We're being told we have to leave New York. I've had a good time here. So I'll kind of wander the streets and 
look at the vast waste that is humanity for a while mm -hmm. until I'm too bored with it. And then I'll just go probably pass out in the back of Leon's car before he realizes I'm there. Fantastic. Yeah, luckily he's in the garage, so it's, there's no there's no light that comes in. Indeed. So yeah, so you all make it way back to the haven before the rays of the sun rise over the city. And you become corpses for a number of hours. The city that never sleeps wakes up. Activity resumes. Uh, at least certain types of activity resumes. Something's always going on in New York. But eventually the sun sets again. You rouse from your sleep of the dead. And I'd like everyone to make a rouse check for me, please. It's a single D10 and a success. Your hunger does not go up, but a failure it does. Okay, I am still at hunger zero. I'm so hungry. I'm at hunger two. Okay, and what about Layla? Oh, I'm, I'm still at hunger one. Hunger one? Uh, yeah, Buck, you, uh, you got yourself down to zero since you had a full meal. So what, uh, what about tonight? Well, it looks like I am going to be uh, back up to number one. Okay. Even though you f you stuffed yourself on pretty rich meat, the beast just lets you know it's never enough. It's never enough. But you guys are met at your haven. There is a sort of an airport shuttle that comes to you and shuffles you off to... It's not one of the big airports. It's not LaGuardia. It's not JFK. It's one of the sort of the more private commercial lines. A little bit out way of the city. You guys see the city pass you as the driver takes you out to this more uh, small airport where a plane is waiting for you all. You get packed in. Short flight. Two hours. Plenty of time to get there safely. And you see the world beneath you as the plane takes off and flies through the night. You see the little dotted bits of light that represent the pockets of humanity clustered together. Convenient that they get so close. Prey so easily harvested in these places where they feel safe. Leon, you see beneath you, you see the lights. But more than the lights, you see the vast swaths of darkness. It's never more stark than it's been up here. Just how much darkness there is out there in the land. Layla, you feel high. You're so close to the stars, so close to the places between light and dark, the, the edges of experience. And uh, Paisley, you are surrounded by mortal artifice, by the achievements of man that keep you aloft. You know, you, you ha can't help but think how uh, there has to be a, a purer way to do this. Perhaps a manipulation of the blood You've seen people with protean grow wings, turn into animals. That seems purer to you. But you're getting there quickly. And yeah, Reggie. Reggie's never been on a plane, so he's having a blast. You're uh, you're having a blast. This is new. This is strange. This is it's a tiny plane, too, so that's weird. It's one of those private planes. Mm-hmm. And then he thinks, huh, I wonder if I could fly. It's a possibility. But eventually the plane starts to descend, starts to come in again on a smaller airport. You see the city. You see the island in the middle of the St. Lawrence River. Giant thing, surrounded by little rivulets of water. Lights everywhere. You see this large, dark spot on the island where the mountain, Mount Royale, is. And all of you, even if you're lost in your own thoughts, when you cross over that mountain, when you see that dark pit, a chill goes up your spine. Just looking at it, you know something's very wrong as that little patch of dark amongst the light of the city of Montreal just jumps out at your eyes and the plane circles lands and the blood covenant lands in the city of Montreal Thank you for listening to this week's chapter of Blood Covenant, a V5 Sabbat story, presented by Simulacra Studios. Simulacra Studios is an entirely listener-supported podcast. If you'd like to support the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash simulacrastudios. Patrons can listen to the entirety of Season 1 right now. 
In addition to gaining access to our private Discord server, where you can chat with the cast and crew of all Simulacra Studios productions. Again, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week.